not the time to shirk. We can do it. Welcome to We Can Do It, a Canadian podcast focused on climate change, the environment, and nuclear energy. Welcome back to the podcast. Today, I'm joined by Mike Renjak, the president and CEO of Bruce Power, which is Canada's largest nuclear power generating station. And I believe until recently, it was one of the largest nuclear generating stations in the world. Uh, Mike, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks. And it still is. It's great to be here, Chris. I look forward to today's discussion. For sure. So just to clarify, is is it the biggest? or I, I We're think- still the largest operating nuclear station in the world. Others are continuing to build out. And someday it will be surpassed, but uh, we are the largest right now. That's wild. I think uh, most Ontarians have no idea about that. <laughs> we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, dive into that. we'll dive into that in a bit more depth and hopefully uh, uh, get people up to uh, current on, on what's going on at Bruce and in the field more, uh, more generally. So, you know, Mike, we're talking um, a couple of days before Earth Day here. We're releasing this on Earth Day. Um, but I think it's interesting to note that there's kind of competing versions of, of what a green future looks like. Something that's on uh, on my table right now is a, a new film that's coming out called Bright Green Lies. Um, and it's sort of, I think, following up on um, this movie that Michael Moore produced called Planet of the Humans. And it's kind of a critique of um, renewable energy's environmental impact, which I think people are becoming increasingly aware of and uncomfortable with. But, you know, in, in both of these films, it seems like the thesis is, well, you know, energy is just bad in general. Um, and they don't really lay out an alternative other than something that's probably kind of disastrous and Malthusian um, because energy is so vital. And I mean, as, as an example of that, um, and this is very timely that we're having this discussion today because my, my hospitals just had a major power outage and we're barely scraping by on, on diesel generation right now. So, you know, as a podcast, which, you know, the byline is, uh, you know, it's a podcast with an, I have a dream attitude towards climate environment and energy. Um, I'm looking forward to looking at alternatives of what um, a green future can look like and, and alternative energy sources um, that can both allow the environment as well as uh, as humanity to flourish. So with all that in mind, Mike, um, tell us a bit about yourself and why and, and how you became involved in nuclear energy. Yeah, sure. Uh, first, my name is Mike Renchek. I'm president and CEO of Bruce Power. And I got involved in nuclear energy in 1982 when I graduated from uh, university. Uh, and I started my career right outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania at Shippingport, uh, Pennsylvania, where the first commercial nuclear reactor was constructed years ago. And uh, I got into nuclear power in an era when you know, my father's industry was still making and it was closing down. So it really provided an economic opportunity for myself and my family uh, and and really has been a a great look at the way we generate energy and generate energy cleanly. So I look forward to to, to today's discussion. Uh, Clearly, you got a lot of background in this, but I've worked in other, uh, predominantly the uh, utility business Mm -hmm. for now about 40 years. And I've worked on fossil uh, fossil fuels, uh, wind, uh, hydro, solar, on and on and on. So I, I've got a pretty good background, including carbon capture and sequestration systems and all, all kinds of things, Batter, early days of batteries and the like. Uh, so it, my love brought me back to nuclear some years ago. And here, here I am at Bruce Power, and we're powering the future here with a clean energy future. All right, Mike, so I mean, I think... Um... You know, a lot of folks in Ontario, they're, they're not really aware um, that we are prim- primarily powered by nuclear energy. Um, I kind of feel, you know, as I've become more educated on the topic that nuclear has been this kind of elephant in the room that, you know, kind of hums away quietly in the background and that people don't really talk about. And um, I, I think it's in- very interesting, again, that, you know, we, we have, um, you know, and I've participated in, in things like climate marches, but people don't realize that at least as far as electricity is concerned, we're leading the world. Um, you know, there's this great app called Electricity Map where you can check kind of hour to hour generation and what sources are, are providing and what the carbon intensity of our electricity is. And Ontario is routinely in the top 10 in that regard in terms of lowest emissions grids. It wasn't always that way. Um, we were 25% coal powered up until I think around 2013 or so. Um, yeah. And I understand Bruce had a pretty big role in, in uh, kicking coal off the grid. Can you, um, let, let's, let's dive into that a little bit. Yeah, sure. You know, when you look at uh, Bruce Power, 
uh, some some decades ago, the Bruce A units uh, were, were shut down in the 90s, uh, pending a refurbishment, and the Bruce B units can continue to run. So we have four units at Bruce A and four units at Bruce B. And at that time, uh, we were rated at about 6,300 megawatts total, so quite a, quite a large capacity. Uh, the Bruce A units were restarted in the early 2000s and then mid-2000s. And uh, with the with the unit one and two coming back online, we were able to phase out coal in, here in Ontario. So when uh, the Bruce units came online, we supply about applied about 70 percent of the energy necessary to phase out coal generation. With that, we saw a reduction from a peak of about 53 smog days a summer, uh, say in 2005, 2006 time frame. Uh, to today, it's zero. In the last four or five years, it's been zero. We might have an hour here or there of an exceedance, uh, but no more. So if you have asthma uh, and you go outside now, you can breathe instead of worrying whether you can go outside and really have a medical emergency at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, I'm, and I'm very familiar with those medical emergencies. I've been in practice uh, for just about 10 years now. Um, so that takes me back to a time when there was still a lot of coal in the grid. I went to medical school in Hamilton, and we also had a more active steel industry at that time. But I remember kind of scraping particulate off of my windowsills on a pretty regular basis. And certainly anecdotally, I've, I've seen a big drop in severe respiratory illnesses. Um, we know air pollution is, you know, attacks organ systems beyond the lungs and is responsible for a significant burden of disease from heart attacks and strokes and cancers and things like that. So, um, you know, but it's it's a really kind of well kept secret. It seems I, I I was researching this topic a little bit because again, this was fascinating to me that you know we're a, we're a world leader in terms of our electricity grid. We're a model for the world. This this phase out um, was called I think by the Ontario Power Authority the the biggest greenhouse gas reductions in in North America. But you know when I was researching it, I, I found your guys' report with the uh, Asthma Society of Canada. Um, but on the official government reports, nuclear is barely mentioned or, or you know, those figures are not not quoted. I have a friend who updated the uh, the Wikipedia article about it um, and, you know, used some of the, the background the primary data. Uh, but anyway, it's it's interesting. I mean, do you feel like there's a, a um, an issue in terms of the, either the industry communicating these benefits or else, you know, the media not sufficiently covering um, this topic? Because, I mean, this is just this is highly relevant to me. Yeah, you know, we get we talk about it every chance we get because I think people need to know the facts and really know the story. Uh, the heavy lifting has been done by nuclear for decades around the world in terms of clean energy. Uh, when we look here in Ontario, because of nuclear and hydro, which nuclear is sixty percent of the supply and hydro is about twenty five percent of the supply, uh, followed by renewable energy is about eight uh, percent. We have one of the cleanest grids in the world for as far as emissions go, and that's also carbon dioxide emissions. You know, if you believe in deep decarbonization, uh, the electric sector is looked at in terms of deep decarbonization having a footprint of less than 50 grams equivalent of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. Well, here in Ontario, we're about 35 grams, mm -hmm. and that heavy lifting is done by nuclear and hydro. And we see that throughout the world. You'll see similar profiles in France and in Sweden, also economies that have very low profile for carbon emissions and emissions in general. But you know, often the world looks towards Germany or California as leading, and Germany is about 500 grams equivalent of CO2 per kilowatt hour with, with uh, many more billions and billions of dollars to invest in California is sitting at about 135 grams equivalent of CO2 per kilowatt hour. It's still, you know, billions to invest. In fact, they're shutting down one of their lone remaining nuclear plants. So they'll have to replace that capacity on top of, uh, of other clean energy they're going to have to add. So you can imagine how expensive this is going to get. And the reason why I say that here in Ontario, our electricity is about 13 and a half cents on average. If you live in Germany, you're paying about 30 cents Canadian and California similar, and there's still billions of investment to do there. Here in Ontario, we already have a, effectively a CO2 free grid, and we should be using that for economic development in the area. Any, you know, any company that locates here to Ontario and, and plugs anywhere into the electric grid is effectively getting CO2 free energy. So you don't have to do any greenwashing. 
It yeah. really is an economic, you know, should be used for economic advocacy, our clean energy uh, sources here. So all of our homeowners, if you're using electricity, you're getting CO2 free energy across your across your grid and you need to feel you know, feel good about that. You've invested in it, you've paid for it, and it's there. Our our clean energy is reliable baseload energy coming from nuclear power and hydro. So we're not dependent on the weather. We we can get through severe weather events just like we saw in Texas in the winter with the crash of their grid. And then California last summer with the rolling blackouts. Uh, we don't have that here in Ontario, and we enjoy a robust supply of electricity that's clean and, and emissions-free. Uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting you, you say that. I know Iceland has become a bit of a site for you know a lot of kind of server farms and high energy using companies to go to. Um, I think partially because they can advertise that their you know electricity is is essentially carbon free. And I mean, in Iceland they have copious amounts of hydro um, as well as some geothermal resources. Uh, but you don't hear that about Ontario. I, I interestingly, I had uh, Paul Accioni on, who's the former um, Ontario Society of Professional Engineers president, and he was saying that there's even more opportunities uh, because we do, you know, produce sometimes a surplus of clean energy, particularly at off demand times, and so we could be doing combination water heaters, for instance, um, some combination heating, where you were kind of using uh, some smart grid ideas to to use that carbon-free uh, surplus energy to, you know, to decarbonize other sectors. So I think there's, there's room, room to even kind of improve further, um, which I think is, is, is really interesting. Um, so we, we've kind of touched on the coal phase out a little bit. Um, I, I want to move a bit into um, talking about the future. Um, you know, we are in the midst of uh, this horrible pandemic right now. Um, and you know, as I was mentioning, my my hospital right now is having a major power outage, and that's not due to the grid. I think it's something internal um, with the hookup. But I mean, it does point to how essential energy is in our lives. And I think you know that earlier point I was making about some elements of the environmental movement waking up to um, the enormous environmental impacts of you know renewable energy, the the mining impacts, and and just the fact that windmills and solar turbines aren't just created out of you know, magical materials, but just like everything else have to be mined and processed. Um, you know, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's interesting just how essential uh, electricity and, and energy is. So in that context, um, I was interested to hear from talking to some folks at Bruce that, you know, your workers have not yet been sort of prioritized in terms of vaccination. Um, you know, when we think about frontline workers and sort of heroes of this pandemic, um, to me, it's, it's, you know, especially in a world where, look, we're using Zoom right now, we're so dependent on, on electricity. Um, can yeah. you give us any update on, on what's going on there on, you know, if you're making progress on that? Because I'd sure like you guys to get vaccinated uh, quickly. Yeah, thanks. You know, we have fantastic people that work here. They work hard. They come in every day. Uh, we have a number of things that we're doing, not only to supply clean energy to the province, but we also generate medical isotopes that are used to sterilize about 40% of the once used medical devices around the world. So if, effectively, if you're in a doctor's or dentist's office or a hospital anywhere in the world, there's a 40% chance that an isotope made here in Tiverton, Ontario, sterilize the equipment that's being used. And I, you know, I think that obligation our people take very seriously and they, they have come to work every day. Uh, we implement very strong protocols here for maintaining a, a safe and healthy work environment. And we've done Quite well. In fact, we have probably one of the premier on-site testing programs uh, in, in the country, if not the world. Uh, since October, we've done about 76,000 uh, tests uh, here at site. And really, since the beginning of the year, we've probably done over half of that uh, to really ensure that we have a safe workplace. And, and, uh, and we've been working steadily with public health to uh, make sure that our people are recognized for their performance. We expect to be in the second wave uh, with the vaccinations and ho hopefully we get continue to get more vaccinations uh, here in the province and we can roll it out faster. So we're, we're excited about that. And we, you know, we've been instrumental in working with public health, uh, not only in our area, but, but throughout the area. We've innovated and came up with mass vaccination centers called a hockey, hockey hubs where we can do up to 3,500 people a day. In fact, I saw an article issued by Grey Boost Health the other day. They set a record for 350 vaccinations an hour wow. uh, going through a, one of the hockey hubs in Hanover. So, uh, you know, we, we have the capability to, to plan these things. We're good at logistics. 
we, you know, we have that safety perspective in mind all the time. So we think we're a good match with public health when it comes to being able to do these things. So again, thanks for asking that. And we're open to be in the second wave and we're working with public health to get, you know, to get vaccines here once they're available. You know, just on the topic of the workforce, I think this is a really important topic because, you know, obviously there's an economic devastation um, as a result of, um, you know, the, the lockdowns which have been necessary to, to control the, the spread of this pandemic. Um, and also within the context of climate change, and we're talking about a you know, transition away from fossil fuels, there's a real concern about, well, you know, there's a lot of good jobs in that sector and how do we have this just transition? And you know, when you when you talk about nuclear, it, it seems like, well, here's this clean energy source. And, you know, there's a lot of high quality jobs um, here in Canada that perhaps provide that model for for what a, a clean energy transition can look like. Can you can you talk a little bit more about like, you know, how many people are working at Bruce or in the sector in general? Yeah, quite frankly, we're hiring. <laughs> so when you look at the nuclear energy sector here in Ontario, between Ontario Power Generation and Bruce Power, we'll be investing close to $26 billion in the renewal of our assets. Uh, here at Bruce Power, we're investing close to $13 billion. We'll be creating 22,000 direct and indirect jobs as it relates to our efforts. That's almost 500 primary uh, suppliers that deal directly with us. And then each of those suppliers have a continuation where they're dealing with other suppliers. For example, we have one $30 million order with an automation company in the area, and they have contracts with a hundred other companies supplying them parts to build robots for us. Wow. Right, so that economic footprint uh, is alive and well. And we, we were able to manage successfully throughout the pandemic to keep our supply chain functional. See, it's a big focus of ours here, here at Bruce Power is to also look after our communities and look after our partners. Uh, when we were able to implement COVID protocols here and we knew they would work, uh, we simply rolled them out to our suppliers. Many of our big suppliers took our protocols verbatim and implemented them at their factories. And they've been able to keep working all throughout this pandemic as we have here at the site. Uh, and when you think about that, Right, a job, job has been hard to come by this last year, not only a, a job, but a, a, a good paying job and, and the, the expansion and the hiring has continued. So right now on, on any given day, we have about 3,500 people reporting to site. Normally, if it, was out, if it was outside the pandemic, we'd probably be close to 6,500. And then all told, there's probably be 11,000 people that have access to the site coming in and out to do different engineering work, uh, trades work, supply components, supply parts. So we are impacting Ontario's economy uh, throughout the province, adding about three to four billion in GDP each year, about eight to 11 billion in GDP for Canada total. And then here locally, you know, we're in rural Ontario. So right. finding a facility like this that can have that kind of employment, you know, we've set up some economic development outreach uh, for Gray Bruce and Huron counties. Uh, since we started in 2016, we've seen about 63 companies relocate into our area now to set up, uh, set up shop to be able to support our efforts. So we've seen probably 250, 300,000 square feet of abandoned buildings, uh, you know, old factories that have been shut down for decades or burned out now, renovated and put in use to do light manufacturing. We've seen the creation of new businesses. Uh, even throughout the pandemic, we continue to see creation of small businesses in the area and we see a growing population. So, you know, we've had a big input here in rural Ontario and our our life extension program started in 2016 and it'll carry on all the way through 2033. So we think we can actually change the economic prosperity for our region, for the province over that time frame, while continuing to produce clean energy and medical isotopes. So we're, we're very bullish on the types of things we've been able to do, not only for Bruce Power, for Bruce Power's employees, but our communities and the people in general that live, live throughout the province. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really interesting point that um, nuclear tends to really support the local economy. And I mean, particularly in, in Canada, where, you know, we have been a, an absolute leader, you know, we created our own uh, design, um, which, you know, met yeah. some of the unique challenges that we had, um, you know, not using uranium enrichment, 
um, and not requiring a heavy forging industry. So, you know, I, I was reading an OPG report and they were saying 95% of the, you know, money invested into the refurbishments is, is staying, I think, even in Ontario, but certainly within Canada. And then the other person I was talking to was uh, Bob Walker, who's one of the union leaders. And he was saying, yeah. you know, he gave me this parking lot metaphor um, because, you know, all energy sources are not created equal in terms of the, the job creation potential. And, you know, so if you go to a, a solar farm, there's really not a parking lot or a wind farm, um, you know, gas plants can operate with a real skeleton crew, but, you know, the parking lots at, you know, Pickering, Darlington and Bruce are, are quite large. A lot of people work there. <laughs> Um, so that, that was just kind of an interesting, uh, illustration. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think you've probably already covered this in enough detail and we'll kind of move on to the, uh, well, some of the, the environmental stuff, know, but um, if you got something to add, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I would, I like to add, you know, when we, we talk about that investment, we are a made in Ontario solution. 90% of the money that we spend stays in Ontario and 98% of it stays in Canada. Wow. So we are a native industry. We work to really for the people of Canada and the people of Ontario, and we're stimulating the economy, like I said, all throughout the province and really throughout Canada. And, you know, it's also I mean, the other, the other thing I've been thinking about is just how, um, you know, this sector is probably one of the only remaining sectors that provides that kind of intergenerational secure employment. I mean, with the sort of flight of our manufacturing base, you know, in auto manufacturing and in steel those kind of jobs just don't seem to exist anymore. And, and I think we've, you know, I, I, like I said, I did my medical training in Hamilton and that was a city that was just devastated by the economic blow of Stelco, you know, largely shutting down. And I saw that every day in sort of these, these personal tragedies of, of drug addiction um, and of, of everyday poverty. Um, you know, people that used to have dignified, well-paying, you know, blue collar jobs. And, you know, now we're largely on social assistance and, you know, it was, it's rough. Like on the medical side, you really, you know, and especially in emergency medicine, like I, I would talk to these people, you know, share some very intimate moments of vulnerability with them, uh, support them through some of what they're going through. But fundamentally, I mean, in medicine, we talk a lot about social determinants of health. It's a lot of this upstream stuff. So, you know, when I, when I hear that nuclear is, you know, too expensive, I, you know, I think the counter is that the money stays here and, and stimulates our economy and, you know, that, that's been sort of my recent recent take on this anyway. Yeah, let me let me talk about nuclear being too expensive. So the Ontario Energy Board uh, provides that pricing year in and year out on what energy sources cost. So when you look at the supply mix in Ontario and look at how much they cost, uh, as an example, Bruce Power were about 7.8 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, so you, know, you have Ontario Power Generation uh, about 8.9 cents kilowatt hour, so a little bit more. But then you're sitting there with wind at about 14.8 cents kilowatt hour, gas is about 14.3 cents a kilowatt hour, and solar is at about 49 cents a kilowatt hour. So that's published annually. So we here in nuclear are the low cost producer along with hydro, which is about six and a half cents per kilowatt hour. So hydro and nuclear keep the price of power low in Ontario. Uh, and, and, and really keep the grid supplied here in Ontario. So we are carrying the heavy and doing the heavy lifting for the province and keeping prices down. That's why, you know, when you look at our grid being so green uh, and CO2 free and, and at about 13 and a half cents uh, per kilowatt hour on average, you compare that to California, which is predominantly renewables at about 30 cents in Germany, still has a great mix of wind and, and coal fire generation at about uh, 30 cents. You know, we're, we're well ahead of the pack here in terms of uh, both keeping electricity prices in check as well as keeping our environmental footprint low. So uh, I think you, when you look at nuclear without nuclear in this mix, prices would be moving more towards what we see in California and Germany. Yeah, I mean, from from what I understand, I mean, we're, we're going to be losing a, a good chunk of our nuclear, I think about 20% of our generation uh, when Pickering closes in 2025. And it looks like a lot of that's going to be replaced by gas, which is a real kind of tragedy to be working, you know, in the wrong direction on this, especially in the context of this climate crisis. Um, you know, the you're mentioning those the economics and, and the, the, the cost of each source. Um, and I'm not sure again, how this carbon tax is going to play out. But you could imagine if you know, if we're at $50 a ton that that gas could get quite expensive um, in relation to, to other sources. So it's, you know, it's interesting, we made a choice um, with the Green Energy Act to, you know, invest heavily in renewables. And I think the tallies around 40 or 50 billion. 
Um, and it's just, it's interesting. I mean, what do you, I know OPG is talking about, um, you know, some new builds at, at Darlington. Um, I'm very curious because I, I heard that uh, at some point in the early 2000s, Bruce had a plan to try and do an expansion into Alberta. And, you know, we were talking earlier about, you know, Ontario being a leading clean energy grid. I mean, uh, some of our provinces are also amazing because they have, you know, incredible hydro resources. So BC, Manitoba, Quebec, um, they do, they do very well, but we have, you know, Ontario has some run of the river hydro, but not certainly not those kind of resources. And when we're looking at high emitting provinces like Nova Scotia or Alberta or, or Saskatchewan, I mean, for me, it seems like Ontario could really be that model, um, you know, on a, on a nationwide level. Um, I don't know if you, you can provide any details about kind of what happened in Alberta, if there's any chance for future expansion to kind of make up for what we're losing in Ontario. But um, if you do, I'd love to hear about it. Yeah, let, let's talk about that. So, so first of all, like we have great assets here in Ontario with our plants. Like when we started our uh, process here of life extension, our plant was rated at about 6,300 megawatts total. Uh, somewhere just, just in 27. Our listeners, for our listeners that don't aren't familiar with those numbers because they're they're big numbers. Um, what does that translate into in terms of households powered or I don't know percent of the grid? Like it's 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 we have the largest nuclear plant in the world. What does that translate into? So we power about 31 percent of the grid. Okay. Today, so 31 percent of all of Ontario's power comes from uh, Bruce Power here in Tiverton. And uh, so somewhere around 2017, we increased our out output by uh, 100 megawatts, so the 6,400 megawatts. And we're continuing to do that. So we have plans that with the right uh, work that's ongoing, we'll have some announcement this summer that you'll see our power to get upgraded again. And then throughout the decade, we believe with uh, the great engineering work and innovation that we have going on with our engineering teams, we, we could we have the possibility of going well over 7,000 megawatts here at the site. So effectively, having added an entire uh, reactor virtually by better improvements, by better technologies, more modern technologies, more efficient uh, equipment as we're doing our life extension program. Uh, also, the, it, it also comes down to the energy that comes out. You know, historically, uh, our units ran at about 83% capacity factor in total. Well, as we renew these units, we're working to push that capacity factor well up into the mid 90s. So we'll be providing a lot more energy, both in terms of total power output and, and time on grid. And you know, the investments that we're making uh, are showing great results. We've generated more power in the last four year, years from our units. Uh, including the you know OPG seeing similar results. They had a unit there, uh, their unit one at Darlington set a world record with over a thousand days of continuous operation, and then here at Bruce, our unit one uh, set a site record with almost 800 days of continuous operation. That means it just sits there for 800 days and continues to pump up power. It's not dependent on on any uh, external events to, to to be able to provide power. So that's safe, safe reliable continuous source of grid that can be counted on each and every day is there. And I, I just think we're really bullish on being able to replace uh, the output of uh, Pickering, uh, at least to a degree with the uh, actions we have here going on at the site. And then we're also partnering with OPG and looking at new technologies. In fact, uh, we created the Nuclear Innovation Institute here locally where uh, Cameco and Bruce Power founded the next generation of nuclear energy, where we're looking at small modular reactors, micro reactors, and even fusion power with general fusion. And that, that whole realm uh, is quite exciting, quite interesting. OPG is leading the effort there with the, with the sighting of, a, of an SMR at their Dartington station. So they're renewing that. We've been working hand in hand with them, uh, participating in a technology selection process. And we're looking to see how we can partner with them to take it forward. And at the same time, SAS Power is, is participating in this as well under the same MOU, and they'll look to potentially build three or four units in Saskatchewan once the, the unit at OPG is, is developed and, and put forward. And, and that's how our industry generally works. Like it'll tie our suppliers in, it'll tie the companies in, we'll all work together, we'll collaborate, uh, and we'll make sure we have a success, just as we've done with the refurbishments. You know, uh, 
uh, OPG uh, finished her first uh, refurbishment on time and on schedule, on time and on budget. And, you know, we've been collaborating with them consistently across that. And we're well on our way here with our, our major component replacements. You know, it, it is uh, the, the title of the podcast is, is We Can Do It. I thought that would be a nice little uh, <laughs> play on words. Um, you know, and obviously you can do is a, a really kind of proud Canadian engineering accomplishment. I think it was called one of the certainly one of the top 10 of the uh, of the 20th century. Um, you know, and, and I think people sort of think it's a technology that's frozen in time or old, but obviously each of the, the sites, you know, there were, there were changes that were made and updates that were made. Um, do you think that there's um, a role for, for more can-do builds? I mean, certainly SMRs have their place in certain jurisdictions and the micromodular stuff's very promising for the North, but we have a lot of um, you know, carbon intensive electricity to replace across this country. Um, and you know, the scale of that's just really huge. I, I, you know, you're from America, so I, I thought this was kind of interesting. I was talking with a friend of mine and he was saying you know, something that's very unique about, about Canada. And I guess you know, maybe not unique in terms of other localities where there's been a lot of state involvement in nuclear is that we do these you know multi-unit um, builds on a single site and that there's a huge efficiency to that you know and that's again why Bruce is so big you guys have eight large candle units there um, you know I, nuclear is I think kind of in a in a moment where there's a lot of struggle especially in the con you're talking about this in the context of um, Earth Day you know where people I think are starting to see the light on on nuclear but um, what do you think the prospects are for, for more can do, um, or just, you know, another large site, like, like we've had in the past here, I, I know it's, it's challenging, I think with the kind of present economic models, but just wanted to get your take on that. Yeah. You know, I think like, as you look at that, you're going to see different areas of the world do different things, depending on the size of their need. Uh, here in Canada, we're, we're blessed with a lot of hydropower. And also our population density has to be taken into consideration. Ontario is a prime example of a perfect application for large units because we, we have such a, a population density there. So I think, you know, I think uh, potentially the can-do reactors, the small modular reactors and micro reactors are gonna have a role in a clean energy future, not only here in Canada, but around the world. And I, and I think others will, will look towards that. In fact, you know, Romania is looking right now at the refurbishment of, of their units and the possible extension of, of, of additional units at, at their site. And those are can-do reactors. So I wouldn't rule any of it out in the long term as we pursue uh, CO2-free emissions. You know, I just read a report today from the IAEA, and they're saying that you know, CO2 emissions are actually going to rise now as the pandemic is loosening up in places and people are getting back to work. And predominantly, uh, the, the, the power source that is going to be expanded the most is coal generation. Yeah. You know, yeah. So for all the expansion of, of renewables around the world, it isn't going to offset what the uh, expansion of coal generation is going to be. And I think, I think in that space is where nuclear fits in well. And you're seeing many countries enter that space and look in terms of looking at projects uh, the UAE is an example. The United Arab Emirates just put two nuclear units online for the first time ever, and they've got two more under construction that'll be coming online, uh, like within the next coming year. So you're seeing you're seeing new entrants into the into the field, and and what's driving them there is the need for clean energy. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about uh, some of the the challenges of nuclear. Um, one of those is is the uh, the waste issue. I know there's a uh, plans for a deep geologic repository, um, and you know looking to get community permission in, in uh, I think Ignace and in South Bruce. Um, you know I've been told that you know you you speak to this issue often, um, and I'd like to kind of hear your take on on your perspectives on on the waste issue. Yeah, let's let's talk about that. You know, it, it's been used by the anti-nuclear movement as a, a way to drive fear about nuclear power. But when you think about it, it's one of the only industries that really captures and contains its products. We don't have emissions. We don't send it out to the environment. Right. So we capture it, we contain it and we hold it in canisters. We have about 50 years of waste right now in canisters that are sitting in an area about the size of a football field. What other industry can make that statement? You know, I often, you know, I often, when you think about clean energies, we talk a little bit about solar panels. Like these solar panels last about 20, 25 years. Like where are they going to go afterwards? What mm -hmm. landfill are they going in or, or worse? Are they going to end up like plastic where they're going to be floating around our waterways, right? Folks are going to dispose of them. There's no recycling program or anything to capture them. 
at any scale like that. And then the same thing with, uh, with wind units. Uh, you know, what happens with those components? They're going and getting buried in landfills. So, you know, I, when I look at the waste issue, uh, I think it's it, both for renewables and nuclear, it's a much better position than, than fossil fuels where the emissions simply go into the air and they're not accounted for. Uh, other industries like the plastic industries, even automotive, like what happens with those wastes? Where do they end up at the end of the day, right? They're not controlled, the emissions aren't controlled. So I think, I think we've got a pretty good story on that once we get past the fear. Uh, for, so first it can be stored safely and it has been for, for many, many decades and can continue to be stored for many, many decades safely. There's some areas around the world that have looked at geological repositories uh, as a way of, of containing it for the long term. Uh, Finland has one, Sweden has announced one, others, others have them. Uh, you also can look then at recycling. Uh, France has been recycling fuel uh, for decades and they've recycled it for Japan, Germany and UK over the years. Other countries have looked at building recycling centers. In fact, the United States used to recycle fuel before the uh, salt agreements, the nuclear agreements with Russia, where Jimmy Carter agreed to take the recycling plants out of service. So there was one in New York and one in Illinois at the time. Uh, so it can be recycled. And when you look at now the newer technologies as it relates to the small modular reactors, you see uh, Bill Gates' TerraPower with a traveling wave reactor that, that uses uh, spent fuel. And then you also can see uh, Moltex here in Canada that's working with New Brunswick Power with an application that can also use spent fuel. So there are plenty of options. They're really not technical technical issues to be had. It's more of policy issues in terms of what, what would be acceptable to governments and how governments want to, want to handle. And I think it's gonna, you know, in the end, it's gonna come down to, to making uh, smart choices around the environment uh, versus fear. And I think a lot of times, that fear component gets amped up. Uh, and quite frankly, it's not based on facts. And a lot of these things are just rhetoric that, that have been repeated so often over the years that people, people somehow think they're real. And I think some of the movies that you're, you're referring to, and there's one called Pandora's Promise as well that came out some years ago that start to poke holes in, in the, uh, the uh, myth, as I'll say it. I think one of the more interesting facts that I found when I was looking into the the waste or the spent fuel issue was, you know, beyond all of the engineering that's, it, it almost seems like an overcompensation. And, you know, I've talked with some people that talk about some of the sort of theatrics that, you know, happen at um, uh, waste storage sites and at, even at nuclear plants where, you know, there's such a desire to prove to the public, you know, that this is, you know, so safe that, you know, we, we put on these booties, you know, to, to deal with doses that are you know, almost less than the natural background radiation, or we, we engineer these waste sites to the nth degree. But, you know, one of the facts that really surprised me was, you know, I think it's the, the, the rock um, at one of the proposed sites, um, you know, even if all of these engineered barriers were to be violated and, you know, water was to dissolve these fuel pellets, um, it takes, what was it, 3 million years for that water to move one meter and the radioisotopes bind all the rock and clay around them. So, I mean, it's, it's, I think the anti-nuclear folks have sold this vision of, you know, deep geologic repository that this waste is going to, you know, come up through the earth like a volcano and, and contaminate, you know, the waterways and the, and the biosphere. And it's just, when you look at the science of it, there's just, there's no mechanism for that. You know, it just, it doesn't make any sense. And I mean, that was a, you know, kind of a revelation to me, just in terms of the, the geologic containment. Um, but I mean, what, how do you feel? What are, what are the what's the best strategy to sort of communicate that um, to the public? Because, you know, we're up against, like you said, um, you repeat the same thing over and over again enough times and it, it, it sticks in people's minds. Yeah, I think it's I think it comes with people like yourself who aren't tied to the industry, exposing these things and talking about it from an, another perspective and direction. And really broadening that, I, I, you know, I think for so many, so many years, the industry has just talked to itself. And, and at one point, it was afraid to talk uh, because of rate cases, because of public perception. And I think it did an injustice, like in the 70s and 80s and 90s. And it really got behind the curve on informing the public. But, you know, I, I have hoped that the younger people especially have an interest in clean energy. You know, a lot of the young people that we're hiring are consider themselves environmentalists. They're coming here because they will know that nuclear energy is good for the environment 
and they feel good about what they do every day. In fact, you know, I keep this on my desk as a reminder, like this little cube, I don't know if you can see it or not, but if you yeah. used all the energy that you use for a year from nuclear energy, this would be the amount of waste that you as an individual produce. So what else do you do in your lifetime that you can make that statement? Think about that, right? The plastic that comes through your home every day, right? The right. gasoline that goes in your car, the, the tires that you change on your car, right? The pieces and parts that come off of it, right? I, I think it's a very much a misrepresented uh, story in that, in that space. So I, I look forward to, the, to being able to continue to talk about this uh, as an industry and, you know, and have people like yourself begin to speak, speak about what you've done the research on and you understand it. And I, I think like in places like Finland where, where the facts were exposed, people took the time to understand you're seeing a small country like Finland move more and more towards nuclear as a as a clean energy source, including building a repository. And you're seeing the same type of momentum in, in Sweden and other places. So I guess just in closing, um, you know, I think Bruce has been talking about uh, a kind of a net zero target. You know, to me, this this seemed a little bit I, I know it's kind of all the rage amongst a whole variety of kind of corporate entities. And, you know, the fact that you're already putting um, what 30% of Ontario's power on the grid with, you know, while producing zero emissions seems pretty damn good, but I know the nuclear industry likes to try and go above and beyond. So, uh, tell me a little bit about, about this effort. Um, what's involved, what, what, what your, uh, what your intentions are here. You know, leadership is about actions. Like, uh, like we were just talking about, you can drum up rhetoric, but at the end of the day, it doesn't accomplish anything. You look at the world, we're struggling with CO2 emissions and yet, we, we work to block one of the cleanest sources of energies there. So we're making a statement with that. We can be emissions free and we're going to work on that. We'll be, uh, I think we're the first public utility to announce that we're going to be emissions free by 2027. And we'll do that through uh, offsets by the creation of a carbon, uh, carbon offset co-op here locally, but to get the agricultural industry involved with us, but also through innovation in terms of how we, how we operate our reactors and how we produce more power here at the site. So I, you know, I think we can do it and by leadership by, is by taking action. So we're gonna take the action to be set the first example of, yes, this can be done, we can do it, right? right. <laughs> so okay, yeah, we, it can, can be done and we're gonna, we're gonna prove that it can be done. I mean, it almost seems like people should be uh, buying offsets from you guys in a sense, but um, <laughs> that's, that's maybe another story. Um, I think this is probably a good, a good place to leave it, Mike. Um, it's been a lot of fun chatting with you. Like I said, um, electricity is uh, precarious at my hospital right now, and they've asked me to come in early. So I, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Um, but again, pleasure having you on. Thanks for, uh, thanks for sharing your perspectives. And thank you. And thank you for you and your colleagues for all the work that you're doing through this pandemic. You know, uh, we, we wouldn't be in the situation we are getting through this without the medical community and the frontline workers. So one, I just want to say thank you for doing everything you do each day and then taking the time to do sessions like this to help inform the public and educate the public. It's just fantastic. And, you know, by working together and collaborating, we'll have a bright future here in Canada and, and really get past a lot of the near term uh, issues that we face in terms of the pandemic and clean energy. Yeah, well, I mean, as, as we say, we're all in this together. And I mean, in terms of my motivations, it's, you know, I see the patient in front of me, but like we were talking about in Hamilton with that economic collapse, you think about the social determinants and environmental determinants of health. So, you yeah. know, I mean, that I, sometimes people are a bit puzzled, like, why is a doctor so interested in, in climate and energy? Um, you know, but that's, that's the motivation. And, you know, when I think about the fact that medical isotopes are just fundamental to modern healthcare. And, you know, I, I have this saying that I, I like my climate cool, my air clean and my surgical instruments sterile. I mean, I think there's, we are all in this together. And, and I think, um, you know, that the more I've learned, uh, the more I see that, you know, that, <laughs> that what I do is kind of dependent on what you guys do. So um, I hope that uh, y'all get vaccinated uh, very soon. Um, and uh, yeah, we're all, we're all frontline workers here. So looking forward to releasing this and, and hearing some discussion about it. Um, and uh, we'll be in touch. Thanks, Dr. Kiefer. Have a good evening and I wish you the best. Bye for now. We can do it. We can do it. This is not the time to shirk. We can do it. Thank you so much for joining us on the We Can Do It podcast. Be sure to like, review, and subscribe.